Charles Finney is a man of great division. Rejecting most of the doctrinal beliefs of the Presbyterian theology, he set out to change the way people would get to know Christ. Taking his knowledge as a lawyer earlier in his life, Finney popularized a type of ministry known as revivalism that focused on offering the gift of Jesus Christ to all who would come. Using brand new tactics, some referred to him as a heretic, others as foundational for American Christianity. Stay tuned as we look at the life of Charles Finney and see why exactly his preaching and ministry caused a stir, leading to hundreds of thousands of lives turning to God and being one of the most criticized pastors of his day for. Charles Granson Finney was born August 29, 1792, in Warren, Connecticut. Finney grew up in Oneida County, New York, and once he came of age, he began to study as a lawyer in Adams, New York. It is said that he grew up as a rationalist skeptic, coming from a non-religious family. But everything changed on October 10, 1821. After a prompting, Finney walked into the woods and cried out, I will give my heart to God or I will never come back down from there. He said at that moment, the Holy Spirit seemed to go through me, body and soul. I could feel the impression, like a wave of electricity going through and through me. Indeed, it seemed to come in waves of liquid love, for I could not express it in any other way. This conviction was truly life-changing. Not only did Finney believe this to be soul-saving, he could no longer go back to the way he was living his life. As he sat with a client, he told him, I have a retainer from the Lord Jesus Christ to plead his call and cannot plead yours. With this swing in his life, Finney left all that he was doing and began a life devoted to the ministry work. Finney would start his theological studies under Reverend George Gale in the Presbyterian Doctrine. But early on, Finney had problems and concerns with many of the traditional Presbyterian doctrines. Although we will discuss more concerning these doctrinal debates throughout the rest of this video, the first issue that caused concern for many was Finney's refusal to enter an educational institute for his studies. Because of his earlier experience with what he said was ministers that did not meet his ideal of what a minister of Christ should be, he rejected educational studies and chose to study theology under Reverend George Gale. This would lead many to be skeptical as his personal beliefs and his non-academic studies differed significantly with the academics of the day. One note to make that I think is extremely important when learning about the life of Finn is that because he started his learning and teaching later in his life and quickly after conversion, his earlier beliefs evolved greatly over his life. Because of this, we will be talking about some of the polarizing beliefs he had as we are introduced to them throughout his life. One of the first claims against him was that he helped spread anti-intellectualism beliefs. It's hard to say whether Finney actively promoted this belief early on in his studies, but when looking at his life as a whole, it's clear that this claim does not hold up, especially later in his life. The concern for Finney was not on educational studies as a whole. He clearly spent years learning under Gale. The problem he had was that he believed that the way the Presbyterian clergy were handling the day-to-day -day ministry was not effective or biblical. But although he had many issues with the denomination, his attempt was not to tear it down but rather to create a new way of presenting Jesus to the people. Because of this, and with his studies under Gill, he was licensed to preach under the Presbyterian Church. After being licensed, he was hired by the Female Missionary Society of the Western District, and he began his missionary labors in the frontier communities. Charles Finney's ministry began in what is known as the Second Great Awakening that started in the early 1800s. Marked by such things as camp meetings and revivals, the main focus was centered on soul winning as their primary function of ministry. The Second Great Awakening could be split up into three sections. The first two were marked by movements from American preachers such as Barton Stone and James McGee, among many others in Kentucky and Tennessee. Also, in the second section, theologians like Timothy Dwight and Lehman Beecher in New England were creating a more conservative phase of the movement. But the third and final phase is centered mostly around Charles Finney, who began his revivalism in small towns in western New York. Finney would get his start going from church to church, leading his unique style of revivalism. The area that he got going in was known as the Burnt Over District in western New York. 
This area got its name because it was a hotbed of religious revivalism. With that, let's look at the context in which the preaching and theology that characterized Finney and revivalism as a whole was created. Before we get into Finney's preaching and ministry, there is an important context that all of his practices took place in. Up to this point, especially in the Presbyterian doctrine, the majority of beliefs were focused on Calvinistic doctrine. The Calvinist doctrine is built upon five pillars of belief known as TULIP. I want to mention them here as it gives a good basis to see why those who follow the doctrine and those educated in this teaching disagreed so much with what Finney and later revivalism teachings would become. I also want to mention that this is an extremely simplified version of this doctrine and you can follow some of the links below to learn more about this belief system. The five pillars consist of total depravity, also referred to as original sin, the belief that all humanity is born into sin at our birth. Unconditional election. The belief that God has already chosen whom will be saved, not based upon the individual's life or actions. Limited atonement. The belief that Jesus died only for those elected by God through unconditional election. Irresistible grace. The belief that those whom God has elected for salvation cannot reject or resist this calling. And finally, perseverance of the saints, the belief that those elected can never lose their salvation. So why does this matter? Well, Finney's early life directly affected his work as a preacher. His sermon outlines looked more like the types of arguments one would use to convince a jury, using logic, persuasion, and playing on emotions such as hope and fear. Far from the dry and disconnected sermons others were sticking to, Finney focused on presenting Jesus as a yes or a no, he rejected the prevailing view of the gospel as a complex theology. He made it his mission to present it in a simple form accessible to everyone. The main reason for all this was because Finney believed, unlike the Calvinist doctrine of the elect, that every person when presented the gospel could either choose to freely accept or reject what they had heard. Because of this, Finney believed that his work and his sermons were vital in the work that the Holy Spirit would do in the lives of the listener. At the end of his sermon, he had what most refer to now as an altar call. Even though this idea had been around before Finn, this would become foundational for the revivals to come. The point of the altar call was to make the decision either to accept the gospel or to reject it. Finney set forth the choice he wanted people to make. He gave no room for neutrality. After hearing his presentation and all of his evidence, the listener was challenged either to accept Jesus or to deny him. One area that he focused on during his sermons was the anxious bench. This bench was designed for those who were being challenged, but did not quite know for sure what they wanted to do. When someone would move to this area, people would come and pray, explain, and talk to them about the decision of following Christ and what that meant. Finney's shift away from the traditional doctrine of Calvinism was evident in the way he approached ministry and was typical of other movements of that time. Many at this time began to build doctrines around what is known as Arminianism, a theological answer to Calvinism. This has caused many to debate what it was exactly that Finney believed and what he should be categorized as now. But if anything, Finney's way of doing ministry rejected most of these labels and overarching doctrinal beliefs. You will see in the resources in the description below, people who refer to Finney as Arminian, Pelagian, believing in perfectionism, or even new divinity Calvinist. For the purpose of this biography, I'm not going to be defending or arguing for any of these sects of Christianity. My reason for this is because Finney himself rejected these types of defining terms. Rather, his focus was on the actual practices that derived from people's beliefs. Because of that, I will be focusing on the life and practices rather than attempting to seek a label for the theological doctrines that surround the life of Finney. And there is no better example that shows the unique preaching and ministry of Finney than his revival in Rochester, New York from September 10, 1830 to March 6, 1831. For these six months, Finney completely changed the area of Rochester. Although some critics at this time pointed to his ministry in the burned over district, and his great success is a fluke since these areas had already experienced great religious movements before he got there. It was this time in Rochester that many critics started to see that Finney's practices were working very well. Rochester was rapidly transforming into a commercial and manufacturing oriented urban center. With this brought greater and greater dividedness between the people of Rochester. When Finney began his ministry work though, at the front of all that he did was inclusiveness for all. 
This meant that there were no denominational separations, no separations of rich and poor, black and white, even man and woman. All were welcome to these sermons and were encouraged to take this outside of his meeting and into the daily lives of his listeners. It is with this focus that another very important part of Finney's ministry is put into practice. Up to this point in America, there was much a debate on how Christianity should play out in the everyday lives of believers. Finney pointed to the fact that because the Presbyterian theology taught that God did not elect those based upon their actions, many had sought not to affect the practices of society. There was also the millennial theology that was becoming popular in these movements that stated Christians were to help transform the world so as to prepare the coming reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. This and many other factors led Finney and those products of his revivals to be a strong supporter of many different social reforms. You can see how this took place when examining the work in Rochester. People such as lawyers, judges, physicians, merchants, bankers, and master mechanics of the city were all among the converts and thus critically changed the way the city worked. Finney and his reformers focused on such things as alcohol, use of tobacco, the theater, as it was a common place for prostitution at that time, honoring the Sabbath. It was said that after the revivals began, nowhere in the city had their doors open on the Sabbath. Rather, they had notes urging people to attend Finney's revival anti-masonry, improvements and advancement of conditions for prisoners, the handicapped, and the mentally ill, as well as women's rights and the abolition of slavery. Finney took a strong stance on the importance of these and would make revivalism forever intertwined with these social movements, but not everyone agreed with what Finney was doing. It was at the time Finney's revivals were starting to come to an end that congregations began to split over the work of Finney. Many churches would become pro-revival or anti-revival, but what really drove home the separation was the focus Finney put on these social movements. But one church thought Finney would be a perfect fit for what they were trying to do. In 1832, Second Free Presbyterian Church hired Finney to be their head pastor. It was said that his ministry consisted of continual revivals over the years. Because of this, he impacted the lives of thousands over the years. And just a few years later, the church would build a new building calling it Broadway Tabernacle. But Finney would only stay at this new church a year as he was called by an old friend to come and teach at his school. John J. Shippard was an admirer of Finney and the revival work that he had been doing. Shippard founded Oberlin Collegiate Institute in the Oberlin Colony, Ohio, which was an entire group centered on the idea of practicing social reform and training Christians to go out and do the same. Oberlin College, as well as the Oneida Institute that was closed and integrated into Oberlin in its early years, is currently the oldest co-educational liberal arts college in the United States. It was also the first college in America that allowed African Americans and women into the same classrooms as white males. And as generally been known for the progressive student activists since its creation. If you want to know more about the very interesting history of these organizations, check out the links in the description below. But for the story of Finney, he began his teachings in 1833. It would be within this institute that Finney would train many people and write some of his most famous works. Two of his most famous being Lectures on Revivals of Religion that outlined all his beliefs about the movement and how to replicate his revival, and Lectures on Systematic Theology where he introduced many of his personal beliefs about Christian doctrine. Finney was 41 when he began his teachings at Oberlin where he was a full-time teacher from 1833 to 1851. In this time, he personally championed many social reforms, especially related to the abolition of slavery. Because of this, in 1851, at the age of 59, he became the second president of Oberlin College. He would be the president until 1866, where he retired at the age of 74. Finney would preach, teach, and write all the way up until the last weeks of his life. It was on August 16, 1875, at the age of 83, that Finney passed away in his home. The legacy of Charles Finney has lived on through many people and organizations still active today. Finney paved the way for later mass evangelists like Dwight L. Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, and many more. Finney's work has also helped spawn many other independent, trans-denominational religious groups such as Mormonism, Millerism, which broke into Jehovah Witness and Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is not that Finney specifically set out to create these types of denominations, but because of his revival work and with his focus on social progressive movements centered on one figurehead, people like Joseph Smith, Ellen G. White, and William Miller found a spot to create their own movement. 
Jones. Another group that was significantly impacted by Finney was William and Catherine Booth, founders of the Salvation Army. Their efforts were largely impacted by the teachings of Finney, both personally and professionally. Finally, although a very divisive person for many, the truth is that he rejected the beliefs of those on the left and the right of many matters of Christian faith and life. Many have debated whether Finney's life should be an example to follow or a cautionary tale of misunderstanding. And many people have written at length from all sides of Christianity debating the beliefs and practices of Finney. But whatever you believe, there is no way that anyone can deny the impact that Finney has had on American Christianity today. From the revivalism still raging strong in parts of the South to the increasing awareness for the need to address social issues, Finney's practices and beliefs can be seen in many places today throughout the country. So, what do you think? Do you think Finney was helpful or harmful to the Christian faith of today? Was his practices manipulative or a breath of fresh air to ministry? Has his impact on society been positive or negative? Let me know your answers in the comments section below where we can talk more about the impact of Finney's life. But hey, feel free to hit that like button, click the subscribe button, and turn on the little bell notification to be alerted about new videos every week. And check out the description underneath the video for all the resources you'll need to learn more about the life of Finney. Thanks for being here today, and I look forward to seeing you next Saturday for another informative and accessible introduction.